Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Ketchum. I'm Vice President of Commercial Activities, Regulatory, Government Affairs, Community Relations, a bunch of things for a company called One Gas. Uh, we serve 2.3 million gas customers across Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas. And we've been around for over 100 years. Um, natural gas is our primary business. It's our only business. We're 100% regulated gas utility. That, that's it. We don't really try to do anything else, and we're very focused on that. So uh, what we're going to walk through today, and this is not a presentation. Uh, so there is no slide deck. This is a workshop. Um, so I do need you to move to another table because you, the groups will maybe move to this one. Um, need at least four, five at a table, and then if I could maybe have a few of my friends back here kind of fill in, maybe some over here, maybe one over there, just so we can have about five at each table. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. And just to double check on recordings, go, okay, sounds okay, all of that. Okay, good. You're good to go. So in front of you is a worksheet, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but what we're going to talk about is what I see as really the, the puzzle of climate change and trying to come up with a plan to address it. Um, there's a really good book out, and I'll, I'll have a copy here if anybody wants to take a look at it, um, that... Help me think about this in a lot of different ways, but it's called Both And Thinking, and it's, it's a tremendous book, and it really gets into paradoxes. It also really talks about how, as a society, we've really got conditioned to be either or thinkers, um, very, very linear, very rational, and I'm not, don't misinterpret this as me saying that you can't be rational and linear about your thinking, but there are things in our life, in society, across the board that require us to not be lazy and to work with paradoxes. And so I did a talk about a year ago now where um, I, I was really trying to kind of honestly work on this topic and better understand it. And sometimes for me, it's better just to go talk to people and try to teach something so I can better understand it. And I, I didn't feel like I, I nailed that. You know, like I'm, I'm like, there's still, I'm missing something here. And I've always loved Rubik's Cubes. And uh, these are in the building, and I was supposed to, and they're supposed to be up here. So I apologize. You're all supposed to get a Rubik's cube. So if you can leave me your contact information, I will ship you Rubik's cubes because these are custom Rubik's cubes. And so, what I like about a Rubik's cube, one, they make my brain hurt. I think it's good to make your brain hurt as much as you can. Um, but it's a really good example, a physical example of what I think we're trying to work on to solve the climate puzzle, climate change puzzle. And so if you think about the different sides, these, these are the main priorities that we have as a company. These are specific to one gas. These are our priorities. And so you've got energy demand, you know, how much energy do people need? You've got reliable. We have to be reliable. People count on it. Anybody that work, lives in Texas or any of our states uh, and you live through Storm Uri, have you heard about that? It is a big deal. Um, lifestyle. That's something that when we talk about climate that we rarely talk about, that that is something, a major part of what all of us can do, each of us can do, uh, is work on lifestyle choices. Do I drive or do I walk is one of the most basic ones. Cost, affordability. This is huge. Um, energy demand, I already mentioned. Safety is another one. That's our, for our company, that's our, core, our number one core value. Um, and, and it is, even though it doesn't seem like there's many safety incidents with electricity or natural gas, there could be if we weren't all focused on this, you know, uh, tremendously. And then obviously clean is something that for our company is, is very important. Um, we are, I'll, be, I'll just share some information with you about kind of us as a company. We're one of the only companies left in the energy business that hasn't set a climate goal. And so anybody wants to leave now, um, you can. Uh, I would completely understand. But let me explain to you why why we haven't done this. We are a public utility. We're regulated. We serve over 800 communities. One of my community relations people helped me out. Does anybody know the number in total? <laughs> it's over 800 communities that we serve. And we've got 2.3 million customers. So two reasons why we haven't set a goal, and we're one of the last that haven't. One is as soon as we set a goal, we've disregarded everyone else's priorities. Those, that goal and our priorities are going to be how we get there. 
And so if I'm in El Paso, and affordability of 70% of my population has, is right on the edge of not being able to survive, and we do something that increases their cost $5, 10 a month, that's going to have a major impact on them. Um, same thing in, an, in another town where their goals are maybe economic development, or maybe their goals are even more extreme than what we would set for an emissions reduction goal, and they want to go further. As soon as we set our goal, all of that kind of gets disregarded. So we see our job is serving our communities, serving our customers. That's the first reason. The second reason why, and it's kind of the heart, it's kind of the heart of this exercise is, is how do you get there? And we could not design a plan by 2050, um, and I have yet to see one that doesn't make a lot of assumptions about new technology. And just who we are, you know, we're based in Oklahoma. We think of ourselves as pretty practical people. If we can't see how we're going to get to something, we're not going to commit to it. And so, but we haven't stopped as a company. We are also, at the same time as we're one of the only companies that haven't set a goal, we're one of the only companies that have now tied all of our pay to emission reductions. So there's a little paradox there, right? And this is a whole conversation about paradoxes. And what I like about this is the company has embraced that paradox. And if you walk away with nothing else today, it's going to be the effort of embracing paradoxes and breaking out of the, the, the either-or thinking and get into the both-and thinking. That's the heart of this. So before I keep going and we get kind of into the heart of the workshop, does anybody have any comments, recommendations, questions? No? Nope. Okay. So in front of you is a worksheet. And so... Your table is going to do this together, but the worksheet is a tool, um, and there's a lot of literature about this, there's a lot of academic thinking, that talks about what's called multi-criteria decision making. And so really this is a decision, kind of a, a way to do a decision analysis tool. And if you look across this, this is, this is basically going to be your, now if you're sitting at a table, that table is now your family, and you're going to try to buy a car together, Okay. And so each one of you, for the first five minutes, individually, first, you should decide who's got alternative car one, two, and three. Put your name next to it. And then you're going to build a sheet by your, the, the, for the whole group. So that'll be your first effort to decide who's car one, who's car two, who's car three. Then what I want you to do is spend five minutes and rank these. What is, so other could be before you do this. Your group can decide, is there any other, category, any other priorities that we want in here? So the other could be speed, could be another one, you know, pace, you know, speed or something like that. So once you get that done, we'll regroup, and I'm going to walk you then through that, that part of how you're going to actually reach a decision, and you're going to, I hope, be able to kind of touch and feel how these paradoxes work. Because the paradox is going to be, you're going to assign these numbers. The paradox is going to be that those numbers will sometimes conflict and how those work. And then by the time we get back out of this, at the end of this session, we'll talk about how you could potentially use something this simple to have those conversations at a local level, community level, organizational level about how you build a climate planning strategy. And for me, it's so much more than just setting a goal. A goal is nothing if you don't have a plan to achieve that. So that's really the heart of this effort. So go ahead and, and welcome, by the way. And so you're now part of this family back here. And so you're, you're all buying a family car. So spend, a, spend five minutes talking about who's got car one, car two, car three, car five. Um, and do we need to move? Do you have six back here? Might need to have someone move to this table. You, do you mind moving over here? And then have a little fun with it. When you build your car, name your car something fun. Keep it weird, right? That's the, kind of the theme of this conference, you know? So have a little fun with your car name. Okay, so I think all the groups have chosen their cars. Can I get a volunteer at each table to tell us about your car and kind of the discussion and observations you made as you were doing that? So one observation I've already made that was kind of fascinating to me already is, and I don't know if this was every table, but quite a few tables just candidly at this conference, I assumed that emissions would be one of the highest factors. And I don't see that's the case. But, um, so that surprises me, I'll be honest with you. So something to learn there, you know, and also something to learn about this kind of dialogue and why this is so important. Um, because if you look at research, everybody 
um, most people, I should say, most people I interact with believe that we have to do something about climate change until it's going to impact them. That's the lifestyle part of the Rubik's Cube. So just an observation, but uh, would anybody be willing to share from your table just kind of a quick overview what you chose and why and maybe some other observations? Oh, okay, so our first one was comfort. We have to be able to get in and out. Next was price. We have to be able to afford it. Third was power and stereo. It needs to have a lot of torque and it needs to have good tunes. And then four, MPG, five looks, and last was emissions. Any observations? Um, we did have one person who put emissions the highest, um, but the rest of us did not. And um, so I, how did you talk about that? I think I we we just kind of wrote down the the votes. Okay. It was it was democratic. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we we talked about everything first that kind of came in in the same top three, okay. and then we decided. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, so, oh, it is on. Um, Go ahead. We'll come back. Go ahead. Help here. So our vehicle was going to be an expedition, and her name was Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first thing we did was we added up all of our columns and then divided them by five to kind of get a weight. And then we tried to match that up with the car that closest matched those values. So uh, we ended up having Johnny's car called Sherry win. Uh, <laughs> with looks being number one, the flashy guy he is. Uh, two being price. Uh, three being safety was the added category we uh, had on there. Four being comfort. Five being emissions. And six being miles per gallon. I think he drives a truck. So, uh, yeah, that was ours. So, so far, everybody's driving what I picture as a giant minivan with a V8. Is that? Okay. Our uh, car's name is Hollywood, and we um, went around the table and kind of tallied up the votes for what we all chose as uh, one through six. Our first and main concern is the price. Our uh, second is the looks of the car. Third is the miles per gallon. Fourth is emissions. Fifth is the comfort of the car. And sixth is our sound system of the vehicle. So what was the name again? Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. Who was the group that was talking torque? Yeah, I thought that was, so that's a paradox. You know, I, that one's real interesting to me because it used to be, the paradox is, is that it used to be that to have torque, you had to have a really inefficient engine. And for some reason, that paradox has got work to the point where now the torque is in a zero emission vehicle, the most torque. So just pointing that out as we go, I think that's really interesting. This team? Um, I think we, we agreed on Model 1 was our car, and it's a one gas thing. Um, first one was price. We obviously wanted it to be affordable. Second was comfort. We treated us like the family, so can we all fit in it? Um, I think we're all a little bit taller other than Safina, so <laughs> it's got to be a little bigger. Um, third, our other was safety. Um, so family car, you need it to be safe. Four, so four actually was miles per gallon, and then emissions was six, but what we decided was if you're getting a larger car, naturally emissions of miles per gallon aren't going to be very good, so we decided those just naturally fall lower in the totem pole. And then five was looks, so we want to look cool, obviously, when we're in our family car, so... Yeah, lights and then emissions. So we've got a giant minivan with an eight-cylinder made by Volvo. It's kind of, <laughs> well, there's a paradox right there. <laughs> That's how my wife and I never ended up in a minivan. We had all that dis all those discussions as well. Are you all close to picking one, picking your one, or having yours, or having yours done? Are you close? Yeah, what, what are your priorities and how would you rank them? You've got that? Okay.
you're, you're, it sounds like he's doing an audit now. <laughs> but you guys are really close. Okay. Uh, okay, let's come back together. This table's auditing, so they're close. <laughs> okay, who would like to volunteer to share yours first? And if you wouldn't mind, come up here, write down your six and how you prior, or just write them in your priority order. And we're going to put them all up here, so just try to leave room. Just go down the list. Yeah, do you want to? Oh, uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. That's what I always do too. <laughs> L I E N C Y. E N C Y. That's a really hard word to spell. You know, auto, auto correct has killed my spell. Number four was energy security. So interesting, no safety. I'm not. This isn't a critique, but I, my observation is that we take it for granted now. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Perfect. Okay, next next group. Are you all ready? Who's ready? You can stay close by Will. Energy reliability. Sustainability. Workforce. Dev. Governance, education, infrastructure, social impact, affordability is in that, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, talk to it. Uh, okay. Okay, everybody. Our uh, our first one was cost or slash affordability. This one's sort of multifaceted. Um, one of which is obviously implementation of new infrastructure. The other one is removal of current infrastructure if needed, and then obviously the, the cost for people. Um, two was resiliency. I wish I could copy paste. <laughs> uh, resiliency, same thing. Jason mentioned it earlier. Um, Texas and Oklahoma people are aware of uh, Winter Storm Uri, the importance of it. So, uh, third is feasibility. I think maybe something <laughs> not talked about enough. Um, so feasibility is 
like how can we create a plan that's one going to be effective but also feasible for people? Uh, four, community or sorry, regional impact. Uh, we had a really good example in our group, which was say Austin, for example, implements the ban of natural gas. Well, a large user is Tito's. And so if you can't have that, you guys can't drink. Um, and that's not very fun. Um, so, but that's just, that's just an example. I mean, there's obviously plenty more. Five, this one's gonna sound really dumb, but emissions. Um, I don't think it was included anywhere else, so. Oh, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. And then last one's lifestyle. Again, Jason mentioned this one. Um, you know, how would a climate change uh, plan affect other people? You know, obviously, we all live different lives, so how would one plan affect others? Perfect. Thank there you. you. Yeah. Are you all done with your audit back here? Okay. You can squeeze them on wherever you're comfortable. <laughs> So implementable, affordable, smart goals, equitable, resilient, innovative tech. education. Thank you very much. So what observations do you all have about these? Any that surprise you? Commonalities? Yeah. Resiliency is big. Yeah, so th the challenge with it, so this is, you know, I described this as come up with a plan. That's really the, the wrong term for this. I mean, just establishing the priorities. So now, Go back to your college campus where you went to school at. Go into your community. And now think about how you can, if you were going to design, do this as a group, how hard this is. This is really hard work. Each one of these, and I'm trying to remember which one was your all's. Was it this one up here? When we were talking about, oh, we were having a conversation about nuclear and then other renewables, so other types of, you know, renewable sustainable energy. And it was a really good discussion because, on the one hand, nuclear seems kind of like a silver bullet. You know, one of you pointed out that, you know, if it was invented today, everybody would say, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing ever. And then another person was really good to point out, but what do you do with all the waste? And what about mining the uranium and building out the plant and all those other kinds of things? And, you know, then it got into a discussion of, well, it's kind of the same thing with wind and solar, you know, and batteries, you know. Anybody wants to run and read a really good kind of documentary book, um, Red Congo, I just read that recently, and it's fascinating from a human injustice perspective, um, just around the mining of, you know, um, of um, cobalt. So that's the heart of this. That's the hard part, and that's where the, the Rubik's Cube, come back to the Rubik's Cube, that's just one square on here. And that's why I, I believe that just setting an emissions goal it, 25, 30, 40 years in the future. One, the people that are setting, standing them, standing up these goals are probably not going to be here to have to realize them. But a lot of us are going to be. That's my worry right now, is that we're not doing the hard work. We're doing the lofty goals that make you feel good, and that's not what this is about. If we're really trying to affect climate change and try to get on a positive track, it takes this kind of work and this kind of thinking. But then you go back to your, like I started with, you go, let's say we go back to your college. Bring together the stakeholder group that's going to work on this together. And it should be a multifunctional one. You know, one of the things I've seen in some communities is they don't want to invite any of the energy companies. And I kind of get it, you know. Um, you know, the people that, are, that they basically, it's described, I was described as basically you just invited um, the, the murderer to solve his own crime. You know, um, truly, that's, and I didn't get offended by it. I, I try to understand extreme perspectives. It doesn't do you any good to just get mad about these things because that person has an extreme perspective because they're trying to pull other people in a, in a direction. It's not that they want to be necessarily just an extremist. So I try to, try to take all that with a grain of salt. But 
when you go into a community, and if you get it, what to get to good plans, what it will take is at a community level, whatever the community is that's trying to design the plan, they need to get the stakeholders together, and they need to recognize and just be honest that these are that we're going to talk about paradoxes. There is no clear answer. Everyone, there's on every one of these, every little square, the, the nuclear versus wind and solar, that's just one example, but every one of these squares, you're going to have to get into that level, and you're going to have to do layers of this type of work. That, that's actually what it's going to take. So out of all the communities, I've, I've, even before I was at my current company, I'd worked across a lot of other states on climate plans and with other communities. Um, and the first one I really saw take this approach that didn't just set a goal and say, like, these are some things we can do to get there was the city of Wichita, good old Kansas, you know. And they have uh, the EPA, um, the, uh, what is it, it is WSU, Wichita State University, the Shockers, is a college there. Uh, sometimes they're good at basketball. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun because they're one of those kind of teams that you can get excited about. They are an EPA certified and receive funding from the EPA for um, economics and environment. And so they're very good thinkers about this kind of stuff. And they were one of the first that I've seen at a city level. They got hired by the city of Wichita to basically run an analysis that's, that's very similar to this. So um, that is the workshop. I hope you enjoyed it. I so apologize. If the Rubik's Cubes, if I can find them in the building in the next few days, I will put them up with, with the team up here and you can pick them up. You can also, um, I'll leave business cards. You can give me a business card, I'll ship it to you, or you can take my business card and you can email me your contact information. So before we break and stop, any feedback for me or final questions? <laughs> good, good, that's what I was shooting for, so, so, so thank you. What would my, my six be? My six would be what's on the cube, because I designed the cube. <laughs> But the one that I would put the, where I would prioritize would be extremely different from what most people would assume. I would, I would highly prioritize lifestyle, number one. That is, that is what no, that is like the, the rail, the wire that nobody wants to talk on the climate change issue. For us to really do this, it's going to require significant personal lifestyle changes. And nobody wants to go there, you know. Um, and we've, there's research out there that, that can kind of prove that nobody wants to go there. Um, you go, if you poll, and I think I said this at the beginning, I've seen national polls. We've polled. I polled at my last company. We go out and we ask people, should we do something about climate change? Everybody. I mean, it's like 93% is like the average. Everybody's like, yeah. It's kind of like saying, you know, do you believe in saving puppies? Well, of course. You know, what happens, though, when someone says, well, here's three. You have to take them home right now. That's kind of what this issue is like. That's what it reminds me of. So um, from a political standpoint, everybody wants somebody else to change. And people get really fired up about this. And some people that work with me know that. And Larry bikes everywhere, and I walk everywhere. It, one of my favorite things to do when someone's getting on me about this is say, well, how'd you get here today? You know, um, Because most of them have driven. They're all about lowering their emissions, but then they're still driving everywhere. And that's... There's a paradox there by itself, right? But that lifestyle change is going to be one of the most significant, but also one of the hardest to address. I, I, I hate to say it, it's this type of environment, but one of, one of the things that um, ultimately seems like it, it, it invariably is the most important is a somewhat nefarious force, and that's who's going to profit off of something. For instance, a, a lot of people don't realize that um, – who was the biggest supporter for Greenpeace against nuclear? It was the fossil fuels industry. And it was because they saw nuclear energy as a real threat. And therefore, they were, you know, made a conscious effort to try to, to, to hurt that. And so you never, that's a big surprise for most people, including me. And so you never know who, you know, why some of these decisions are, are made. But a lot of times it does go back to the almighty dollar. Yeah, I, I've learned over my career, you can almost always use the phrase, follow the money to figure motivations out in a lot of these kind of things. Um, you know, for nuclear, I bring it up. I think it, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of perks to it. It's not a silver bullet. That would be and or thinking, you know. Uh, and what we need is to recognize that solar is a part of the picture, or uh, nuclear is a part of the picture. It's not going to be the only thing. Um, but that's, that's the hard part about this is everybody is still looking for that silver bullet. I don't believe it. The silver bullet is this, is doing the work. That's going to try to fix all of this. And it definitely isn't just setting a goal with no plan to get there and hoping. And I hear a lot of people say it's a moonshot. 
we did that for the moonshot. And I, 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 I love history, and so I like to look at these things. Um, the moonshot, the, you know, when JFK challenged the country to do that, all the technology already existed to accomplish that. Most people don't recognize that. You know, yes, there was more technology got developed to make it happen, but um, the moonshot is, is, a, a la is lazy thinking, in my opinion, and not going to get us where we need to be. Other thoughts or observations? Nope. Well, I appreciate your time. It was a lot of fun. You guys were a great group, so thank you.